Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the regularly scheduled meeting of the Planning and Land Use Management Committee meeting for May 21st, 2019. I'm Councilmember Curran Price, filling in for our chair, Councilmember Harris Dawson. And I'm very pleased to be joined by my colleagues, Councilmember Bob Blumenfeld, Councilmember Gil Cedillo on his way, and uh, Councilmember Greg Smith in place. Um, if there are any members of the public wishing to speak, you must complete a request at the kiosk located in the back of the room. If you wish to speak on more than one item, we will be hearing, we will hear all comments during the multiple agenda item comment segment of the meeting. Uh, and if you are, in, and you will be allowed to speak for a total of two minutes. Members of the public wishing to speak on one agenda item only will have an opportunity to, to speak for one minute when that item is called. Uh, you may speak on non-agenda items within the subject matter uh, jurisdiction of the committee during the public, during the general public comment uh, segment of the meeting. Okay, we're going to be taking public comment prior to discussion of today's agenda items, and it looks like we've got uh, two. No. Okay, these two. Okay, we've got several cards <laughs> for general comment, uh, and let's begin with. Uh, Looks like Rosalie Andrade, followed by Pasadena Herman. Hello, Councilman. I'm actually speaking on item 11. Um, I wanted to inform you that I fully support the fake project and the well design of the project. It includes something for everyone. I like that there's 82 affordable housing units that are going to be included in this project and that it's going to create many new pay good paying jobs. The hotel component of the project will be great and hopefully it will open in time for the 2028 Olympics so that visitors from all around the world will visit South Central LA. I respectfully request your support for the big project. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your comments. Mr. Herman. Mr. Richardson, good afternoon. You know, I find it very disruptive when the report on ongoing develop of the city planning policies, work programs, and operations has criminally disrupted the way the city manages its committee. But because most people don't believe in facts and rather go by opinion, my opinion is fuck your policy and fuck your ideas. Ideology based on Narcissism, theft, and abuse, you Cretans, is offensive. See, but most people here don't got the balls to tell you to your face, Mr. Richardson, or I'm sorry, Mr. Price Richardson. And then my okay, final thank you. minute. Thank you for your time. Okay, you've got the general public comment. One minute, please. You're going to come back. We're going to ask you to come back. Okay. That, that, that'll, clo that'll close. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. General public comment uh, is now closed. I did. We're going to be taking multiple item comments now. And we have uh... <laughs> okay. Let's have uh, Herman. I know what I'm doing. Just, 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 just comments, please. Ten motherfucking years talking about retaliation. All this time, Madam Clerk, Councilmember Price. Yes. I just want to clarify: Is this multiple? Agenda item comment? Yes. Okay. So you get two minutes? Two minutes. Okay. 
square into a fucking money hole, you fucking assholes. That's all you do is steal. I was up there with Joe Blow, suck my cock committee, and what did he say on the trade? He said he was stealing money from Seabreeze because the dumb cunt policeman with the silver tongue knew that in Seabreeze you were building things not in compliance with the American Disability Act, and for that reason, I'm here to judge, persecute, and bring the Cretans to their knees. God bless America and suck my cock. Okay. Uh, Red Chief Hunt. Red Chief Hunt. Okay, is Chief, Chief Hunt here or no? Okay, we're going to uh, close the multiple, multiple item comment period. Uh, members, we're going to uh, continue item six and 10. I did close the multiple comment items. And we're going to uh, t continue items 6 and 10. Council member, do we have a date certain for either of those? Pardon? Do we have a date to which we're continuing those at this point? Um, do we have a date? June 5th. We, we can continue those items till the 28th, June 28th. Uh, count, um, council member, committee chair, Andrita Moreno with the office of the city clerk. Just for clarification, uh, is item six, is that can, um, a request for a 15-day extension that goes to council? Item six and 10. Yes, you will need those 15-day extension. We're going to continue those items until the 28th, May 28th. So item six, to clarify, Councilman, that will go to Council to request a 15-day extension since the current deadline is June 5th. Okay, I think we have a disagreement on that. Hold on. Oh, so May 28th. Okay, May 28th. Okay. May 28th for item six. Stays in committee. And item 10 is June 5th. So item 10, Councilman, you said June 5th. No, no, no they both are the same date. I think. Yeah, June, I'm sorry, May 20th. May 28th for both items. Okay, thank you, Council. Sorry for the Item six and confusion. Okay. Six and both May 28th. Okay, we're going to, moving along with the meeting, we're going to uh, move items three and four on consent. Um, There's no objection. Councilman, on item three, uh, CD10 has provided substitute, substitute instructions and they've been submitted to the city clerk. I believe there's a representative from CD10 present. Okay. Uh, he's here. He, so the revised language has been submitted. And on item four, uh, Councilman, you will need to take a couple of actions. Uh, one, there's two items, there's a motion before you and a report from the Department of Building and Safety as to a proposed ordinance. So you will need to adopt the motion on item four, 
approve the B Department of Building and Safety report and request the city attorney to prepare and present the ordinance. Okay, so we need a, we need a motion on item four. Correct. I think you need a motion actually on both because it's revised. So um, I would advise that CLA call item number three and then the um, committee can make a recommendation as to adopt the revised um, recommendations um, from council. Okay, so our first item then is. 10. So on item three, councilman, it's a motion Wes and Ryu. Um, it's asking or instructing rather the planning department, the CAO, and the city attorney to prepare a report relative to the department's expedited processing section. Um, CD10 submitted revised language in lieu of the language embedded in the motion. If you'd like me to read it for the record or... Yes, please. please okay, please so the it. language submitted by CD10 um, is instructing the, the council to instruct the planning department to report back on a short-term strategy for processing conditional use requests under the BEST program and two, a long-term strategy that provides for long-term solutions for the BEST program. Uh, in addition, there's a second moving clause that it's instructing the planning department and the CAO and the city attorney to prepare a report on the current backlog of applications and the feasibility of charging project applicants for overtime costs. Okay, I'll move to... Uh, adopt it as amended, Councilman. I'll, I'll move to adopt the amendment as uh, presented. Is there a second? second? Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, out of objection, that will be the order. And, uh, and item four? And on item four, Councilman, uh, to reiterate, if you could please adopt the motion, approve the Department of Building and Safety proposed ordinance, and three, request the city attorney to prepare and present the ordinance. Okay, I will move that motion. Thank you, Council. Second. Without objection, that will be the order also. Thank you, members. Okay, let's, uh, let's move on to uh, item two. Uh, item two, Councilman, this is a motion Bond and Harris Dawson. It's instructing the planning department along with the housing department and in consultation with the city attorney to prepare and present a permanent ordinance to implement the Mellow Act. I uh, believe that Councilman Bonin is in attendance. Okay. Uh, we've got... Uh, 45 here. Mr. Chair? Okay. Uh, Mr. Bonin? We'll recognize you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As a safe, uh, as a safe bet, go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. I wanted to come down here today uh, to testify on this. Uh, it's initiating an action, but it is a, a really big deal action in my district, uh, in the coastal zone, and for the city of Los Angeles and for our efforts to protect and preserve and promote affordable housing. Uh, back in the 1970s, the voters in the state of California took a big step to protect access for everybody in the coastal zone when they approved the Coastal Act. Uh, a few years later, in 1982, the state legislature took a very big step to protect affordable housing in the coastal zone when they approved the Mellow Act. The intent of the Mellow Act was to compel coastal communities to preserve and protect affordable housing in the coastal zone. In the 11th district, that would be uh, most of Venice, it would be most of Playa del Rey, and it would be a very good chunk of Pacific Palisades. The city of Los Angeles has failed to effectively implement the Mellow Ordinance. The city got sued in 1996 by a predecessor to the Venice Neighborhood Council, the Venice Town Council, and settled a lawsuit which in the year 2000 created interim administrative procedures, which have been our sort of technical way of, of trying to comply with the Mellow Act. Uh, it is full of loopholes. Uh, back when I was Chief of Staff to Councilmember Rosendahl, I actually suggested that we try to implement a permanent ordinance with more teeth into it. And there were some in the city and there were actually some in, in the affordable housing community that were afraid that the city, if it opened it up back then, would have actually weakened the requirements for affordable housing. That is not the moment we're in today and that is not what we need to do. We need to take more aggressive steps to preserve, protect, and actually promote affordable housing in 
Pacific Palisades, in Playa del Rey, and in Venice, where we have been hemorrhaging affordable housing. So this direction today would actually uh, ask the Planning Department and HCID, along with the City Attorney's Office, to come up with a permanent mellow ordinance. And in that, I would like us to close a number of the loopholes. Right now, under the current system, if you, if you remove a unit of affordable housing, you are, you are required to replace it, but you can do it at any affordable income level at all. You can take out a, a very low income unit and replace it with something that is workforce housing. That is not correct. Uh, right now, uh, people who are displaced do not have a right of return. That is something we should include. Uh, right now, uh, this only applies to developments of 10 or more. We should lower that threshold. Uh, right now, the way it is written is you can actually uh, displace units of permanent housing, uh, of, of affordable housing, and then replace them outside of the coastal zone which violates the very spirit of the Mellow Act and violates what I think should be a central tenet of affordable housing in Los Angeles, that it should be in every neighborhood. And even the, the communities near the coast should have its share of affordable housing. So I would like us to see uh, getting rid of, of that system and require that affordable units to uh, be built on site and to be available at the same time as the market rate units. A lot of loopholes to be closed. This is a great opportunity to do it. This is a great opportunity for the city of Los Angeles to say, yeah, we're serious about affordable housing and we're serious about it in the coastal zone. So I ask for your approval today and look forward to the departments doing their work uh, rapidly and coming back so we can protect what exists before it's gone and promote some more. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Bonin, for your, for your comments and for your passion on this issue. Um, Members, are there any comments, questions? Okay, we've got uh, Romney uh, Ganshaw for a comment. Thank you, good afternoon. My name is Romy Gancha. I'm an attorney at the Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles, and I just wanted to come here today to express LAFLA support for uh, Councilmember Bonin's motion. Um, LAFLA was party was the brought the lawsuit that Councilmember Bonin mentioned back in the 90s, and has been at the forefront of Mellow Act enforcement for over 25 years in the coastal zone. The, as Councilmember Bonin mentioned, that lawsuit was settled, and the interim administrative procedures were adopted. We've been closely monitoring the enforcement and the effectiveness of the IAP for the last 20 years or so, and it's, it's been a pretty good procedure for the last 20 years, but as Council Member Bonin mentioned, there are a number of loopholes that we think need to be closed, and the reality is that the nature of development has just changed dramatically in the coastal zone from how it was in the early 2000s. So we strongly support this move to develop a permanent ordinance, and we look forward to working with the Council, with the City Attorney's Office, with HCID, and drawing on our expertise on enforcing and implementing the Mellow Act um, to build a strong ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to close the public comment on this item uh, and uh, go back to multiple comments. Uh, 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 Councilman, uh, on this motion, you may wish to take an action on the on item two to adopt the motion. Okay, I move that we approve the motion. Uh, Second. Okay, without objection, that will be the order. Thank you. All right, let's go back uh, to open up uh, multiple, multiple item comments. Uh, we missed uh, Wayne from Encino. And we certainly don't want to do that again. All right, two minutes. Uh. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, that's right. And the last thing you want to do is upset crazy motherfuckers here. So, no, the director of all status of the city's planning. Fuck them. They got nothing to say. They all a bunch of juju birds and foes and everything in between. And I see Greg Smith, I see him sweating like a pig. <laughs> Yes, because...
because he doesn't like what Bonin did. He want to keep the Mellow Act just the way it is. It made England a Canabian island, millions and millions of lobbying dollars. That's how we built everything. All that shit down there in Venice you don't like. It came from our developer friends because they to exploit the loopholes and they ruined Venice and turned it into a first class world shithole only for multi-millionaires. Now see, I used to live down there in Venice. Yes, that's right. I had one of them three-story dingy wingy houses and I had a little ocean view called a pocket view. And then you know what? The goddamn bank came down one day with a bunch of goddamn cops and threw my ass out of my motherfucking house. Now, you know why? I forgot to pay my mortgage, Mr. Smith. I did what Herb Wesson did. He don't pay his mortgage. I did what Mr. Price did. He didn't pay his mortgage. How come I can't stay in my house by not paying my mortgage when all of them go through the Brotherhood Bank? See, that was the problem. So that's why I'm just saying that we all share these fucking little secrets, all these little secrets down there. You see them all here. Psst, 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 psst. But it'll be our secret. We're here to do a pony show. Don't worry, my developer friends. Don't worry, lobbyists. We're going to fuck the public. We're going to open more low poles so you can build more of your low quality shit at high prices. That's right. And then I get. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your comments. Charles J. Fisher. Mr. Fisher. All right, another minute, sir. Another minute, please. Yes, sir. So you see, who's the puppet and who's the puppet master for? That's right. That's right. There's only one puppet master in all of L.A. County. 43 years strong when I was five years old. My dad took me in my first meeting. That's right. He said... Do I shoot the one motherfucker to the right or the one to the left? I flipped the coin and left the road. Plausible deniability is a big fucking plus. So we here, we here to steal, we here to bribe, we here for corruption. We're here to do everything that Jose Weizar did. That great gentleman. Let's give him his hand on his retirement. Yes, sir. Ain't nothing better than Jose Weezer. Jose Weezer is the Jesus Christ. Jose Weezer is the Muslim of corruption. He's the Mohammed of corruption. Thank you, Mr. Weezer. Now let's get back to stealing and building more crazy projects. Okay, thank you. Your comments. Okay, Charles J. Fisher. Two minutes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Well, I love this. It's not the greatest way to do things. Uh, first off, I'm an appellant on item seven. And I would like to be able to speak during that time. And on item nine, uh, this is a clear case of bait and switch. You had a developer that came in with a small scale project, and now he has a four unit large scale project. We were trying to save the historic buildings on the site. We weren't able to. They have since been demolished. But we are concerned about the fact that the uh, building that is, they're planning for is completely out of scale with the neighborhood. It is a neighborhood that would be eligible for an HPOZ. Uh, this building will tower over everything. And it's only four units, yet it's huge. And part of the reason I know he doesn't want to dig down for parking because there used to be a gas station on part of the property, and there may still be... Um, a tank there. I don't, we don't know. So those are some of the concerns we have with that one. Uh, the other two I was speaking on were items 11 and 12, and I will just state on those the destruction of a historic district that is listed as eligible for the national for the state register. Um, where there's no. They're only asking for an um, oh, a statement of overriding considerations because there's no way to mitigate this loss. And we are asking that this loss be, be
be prevented and that these houses, which these buildings, which all happen to be um, uh, low, moderate income, under rent control, which we are losing constantly in this city, and they need to be preserved. And this type of housing needs to be preserved. It's not being replaced, certainly not being replaced in kind, and it's not being replaced at all. And um, I thank you very much for your indulgence. But again, on item seven, I would like to come back as one of the appellants on that one. Thank you. Thank you. We're going, to close, we're going to close the uh, multiple items at this point, and uh, that takes us to item one. Um, item one, Councilman, is the weekly director's report. Mr. Director is on his way. Thank you, uh, Chair Price and members of the Planning and Land Use Management Committee, Vince Bertoni, Director of Planning. Real quick, um, this week we are wrapping up our Planning 101 training series. This is where we've gone out to the, our, the various communities in Los Angeles to um, help them understand what the planning process is in Los Angeles. This year's series has been focused around environmental planning, so planning in the environment. Um, we had a meeting last night in West LA at the Henry Medina Park and Enforcement Center. Tomorrow night we'll be in the North Valley at Pacoima City Hall. And Thursday we'll be in the, in the harbor um, at Banding, Banding's Landing Community Center in Wilmington. Um, we've been averaging about 50 RSVPs for trainings. So we've had some good representation. And this year we're doing something um, a little bit different. We're doing a webinar. So we'll be, our last part of this series will be a webinar on Wednesday the 29th. And that one is so far the most popular at about 250. <coughs> excuse me, 250 RSVPs. Um, with that, that concludes my report, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Mr. Bertoni. Uh, next, we'll receive and file that, and uh, next we're going to take items 11 and 12 together. Okay. Items 11 and 12, Councilmen, are interrelated. Item 11 relates to the appeal as to the vesting track map um, and the hall route, and it's located in CD9. The appellants are Mitchell Sy on behalf of SAGE and Jim Childs on behalf of the West Adams Heritage Association. And item 12 um, relates to the vesting zone change, the high district change, um, and four uh, land use entitlements, two conditional uses, a ZA's determination and a site plan review for a mix income housing project that includes very low income housing units in CD9. Okay, thank you. We've got uh, someone from planning. Good afternoon. My name is Milena. Uh, my name is Milena. I'm with the Department of City Planning, presenting on the FIG mixed use project. It's uh, with hotels, student housing, mixed income, and commercial components. There were two appeals filed on the project. Um, they appealed the certification of the EIR, the approval of the tract map and hall route, and the approval of the hotel conditional use, alcohol sales, transitional height deviations, and the site plan review. One of the appeals was dropped by SAGE. Uh, the second appeal by the West Adams Heritage Commission is still standing. The appeal points presented by WAHA are the same as the appeal points presented on the first level appeal of the track map. Uh, each of these points were fully addressed in the previous February 2019 appeal response report, and this is supported by substantial evidence in the record. Therefore, we recommend denial of the appeal, and uh, we recommend certification of the EIR, approval of the vesting tentative track map and hall route, and um, as the second portion of uh, the other item before you today is the zone... Uh, the vesting zone change and height district change. The proposed zone is in conformance with city plans and policies, and therefore we recommend approval of the zone change. Uh, just a quick note, the applicant submitted a letter to the file on May 17th requesting some minor revisions to the queue conditions to clarify that if less units are constructed, that this would proportionally affect the number of affordable housing units, and to um, clarify language regarding the CRA successor agency. So we reviewed the conditions and we agree with the applicant's requests. Um, we also received an additional uh, contact from Metro and they requested that an additional condition of approval be added to the site plan review um, to clarify conditions of where the bus stop should be re relocated on 39th Street. So I just wanted to read that condition to the record and we recommend 
including this as new condition D20 for the site plan review. Okay. Um, Metro bus stop, the driveway serving the hotel port co share will be entry only from the west end and exit only from the east end as requested by Metro and identified in Exhibit A project plan stated February 14th, 2019. In addition, a red curb will extend from the intersection of Figueroa Street and 39th Street eastward to the west driveway. Serving the hotel port co share in an area of up to 50 feet west of the driveway will be kept free and clear of any landscaping or other sidewalk improvements that may impact boarding and alighting of bus passengers. Uh, the applicant has had a chance to review the condition and is also in agreement and is uh, the condition is consistent with the plans. Okay. That concludes our presentation. Does, does that conclude your presentation? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll have a uh, testimony now from one of the appellants, uh, Mitchell Sai. We'll have five minutes, Mr. Sai. Hi, good morning, Chairman. Um, honorable Commission members, my name is Mitchell Tsai. I'm attorney here on behalf of SAGE. Um, as communicated in a letter that was submitted at 9 o'clock this morning, um, SAGE is respectfully requesting denial of its, of, 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 of its appeal. As a result, SAGE and um, the FIG developers for the FIG project have, um, resolved, uh, have resolved our concerns regarding this project. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jim Childs, another appellant in this matter. Mr. Childs. Uh, good afternoon. Jim Childs for West Adams Heritage Association and also for the Friends of Flower Drive. And I have this pass out that I'd like to hand in at, at this time. Um, we are and have been opposed to this project because it fails to acknowledge and protect the historic district which it chooses to instead demolish. Uh, you are being told that um, eight historic buildings will be demolished to make way for this very important project of USC student housing and a hotel. Uh, you're going to, if you approve this of course, demolish affordable housing. Um, it's affordable housing that's been there for almost a hundred years. It is part of a California Register Historic District. The other 11 buildings are on the 3800 block of Flower Drive. They will be demolished as soon as this is demolished. Without any question, you will lose a California Register District that was dedicated to affordable working people's housing and has stood there as that symbol for, as I said, almost 100 years. Um, it's unfortunate that the applicants, the, uh, the, yeah, the applicants, I'm the appellant, it gets confusing sometimes, um, chose to proceed with this knowing full well when they bought the property and developed the property that they were dealing with historic resources, they were arrogant and could care less. And apparently city government could care less as well. Uh, we've asked for the help of the city government to join with us to protect our resources, our historic resources, and we've been shunned from the very beginning. Even the Cultural Heritage Commission has been silenced on this issue. It's unfortunate. Uh, it could be easily corrected because we stand ready to join with the developers to meet all their goals if they instead of doing a seven story flat out development go vertical. That's correct. Preservationists are supporting a vertical solution to this issue. Uh, by going vertical, which is where they started when they first walked in with us uh, three years ago, uh, we would be able to save the historic district and accomplish everything that they need to do in order to make their project work. They're not interested in that. Hopefully you'll be interested in this because it's your responsibility, especially you, Councilman Price. This is in your district. You've known all about it and you haven't helped the preservation community or the city's history by supporting this unworthy development. And by reconfiguring it and reducing it so that it's only seven stories high, apparently to facilitate 
the soccer stadium across the way and their billboard programming. That's the only thing I can find that really is justifying this. You are willing to, to dismiss one of the only, as far as I know, historic districts that relate to working class people because of its architecture and because of its subject. It is a homogeneous two blocks district that will be lost forever. It's the remnant of the Zoblin estate. The Zoblin is just north of this project. It's an HCM. You don't know about Zoblin because you don't know about your history. And the reason we do historic preservation is so that people will become aware of your history. Mr. Zoblin was one of the most important people in the city of Los Angeles. His name is lost because we don't deal with history in this town very often, and it's most unfortunate. The demolition of this will eliminate any trace of what happened here at a very important juncture where we transformed from agricultural to, to modern, what we would call industrial Los Angeles. And it can be saved, it should be saved, and if you ask the EIR to be rewritten, so that an alternative was put in there so that you, the decision makers, could look at that alternative and go, yes, there's a way to make this all work so everybody can profit from it. That would be what we are looking for. But they chose not to put it in their environmental, their choice. They chose to ignore a collaborative solution to the problem, their choice. So I would ask you to favor my appeal and ask them to redo their environmental draft EIR to a SEER and include a positive preservation alternative that we can embrace, that you could embrace. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so next up is the project representative, Bill Delvac. Or Good afternoon, Chair Price, Honorable Committee Members. Todd Nelson from Arm Brewster Goldsmith Delvac here on behalf of Ventus Group, the applicant for this project that's before you. Uh, with us today is uh, Scott Gale, President of the Ventus Group, as well as other members of the applicant team. Um, would like to thank planning staff for their presentation regarding the project and the recommendation to deny the appeals and approve the project. Um, would also like to thank the staff and the council member from Council District 9 for their input and feedback um, regarding this project to help ensure that it will be a positive contribution to the community. Um, the project is a transit-oriented infill development at 39th and Figueroa that will be bringing new student housing in close proximity to USC, new lodging opportunities in close proximity to USC, Expo Park, and downtown and 104 new market rate units and 82 new restricted affordable units, um, as well as neighborhood serving retail and restaurant uses. Um, this project will bring new construction and full-time jobs. The applicant has entered into agreements with the building trades and hotel workers to ensure that these will be high quality jobs. And the project enjoys strong community support. And we have a petition in support of the project signed by over nearly 1,500 individual supporters that I'll submit to the file. Throughout the process, uh, the applicant has engaged extensively with the tenants of the existing residential units. I'm pleased to report that we have reached agreement with 24 of the 25 tenants um, with an agreement that will ensure that relocation benefits in excess of city requirements will be provided. Also, as uh, Mr. Sai represented, we have continued throughout the process to engage with and discuss um, SAGE's concerns and are pleased to report and concur that uh, we have entered into um, a resolution of those concerns and echo Mr. Sai's request to respectfully deny their appeal. Um, regarding the appeal filed by the West Adams Heritage Association, um, it is true that the project will result in impacts that are significant and unavoidable to historic resources. The IR fully disclosed that, fully analyzed those impacts, and also included multiple preservation alternatives in the EIR. This project was fully disclosed and fully analyzed. The preservation alternatives were not um, identified as feasible because they did not meet the project's objectives. Um, and in discussions with West Adams Heritage Association, there were discussions of design, uh, design alternatives, but no consensus was reached between the applicant team and the preservation advocates. Um, for these reasons and for the, for the 
important reason that the project's extensive benefits outweigh the significant unavoidable impacts, we respectfully request that the committee recommend denial of Waha's appeal. Um, as staff mentioned, we have provided a, a letter requesting minor revisions to some of the existing queue conditions, um, and again, respectfully request that the committee deny the appeals, both appeals, and recommend approval of the project with the modified conditions of approval. Our team is here and available to answer any questions you might have. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your comments. We've got some uh, public comments at this time. Mary Uritia, Jesus Escalon, Coach Dean Golden. Good afternoon, council members. The single most important issue in South Los Angeles is a lack of housing. We urge you to support this important new project. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Riscanon, followed by uh, Dean Golden, followed by Daniel Barajas. Good afternoon, council members. Thank you for conducting this public hearing today for the FIG project. Our community needs jobs and affordable housing. The FIG project will provide these important needs in our community. The FIG will create 82 units of affordable housing that will help those residents in need of a nice and new apartment at a rent they can afford. The FIG project is also committed to providing jobs to the community in the construction phase and operational phase of the project. I really hope this project is approved because South Central deserves Nice new apartments and good paying jobs. Thank you for the support of the FIG project. Thank you. Good afternoon, good afternoon, honorable council member. The FIG project will create over a thousand construction jobs and several hundreds upper operational job once the project is completely built out. The FIG project owners and committed to hiring locally and helping a, our community with our with new employment opportunities. This neighborhood really needs new jobs. We need good paying jobs in our community that can help sustain a family. We look forward to working with the FIG in the near future to help spread the word about employment opportunities. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for... Uh, Is this Mr. Barajas? Oh. Well, who's you looking for? Yes, sir. What's your name, sir? Oh, Dean Golden, Coach Dean. Okay. Did you just call me? Yes. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. I just wanted to say for the FIG project, it appears to me they have dotted their I's, crossed their T's, jumped through hoops, and have met their requirements. So to me, I see a no-brainer yes. I am proposing that you finalize allow this project to go forward. Uh, I've got my brother Dale here. He wants to say a few words. Hello. Uh, thanks for allowing us to speak. We are uh, fairly new to the neighborhood, but we have been here for several years, and we have uh, seen a lot of improvements and see that the developers of this project has got the heart in the right place and we are looking forward to working with them as a social enterprise endeavor. All right, thank you, sir. Thank you both for your comments. <laughs> Alfredo Galdemez, Anel Bacera, Eric Cuba, and Lydia Rosales. and Daniel Barajas. Good afternoon, council members. As a resident, I'm very happy and Please exciting. identify yourself, sir. Pardon me? Please identify yourself. Oh, my name is Alfredo, sorry. 
Thank you. Residents, I am excited and happy to hear about the FIC project. It will be constructed in South Los Angeles. Uh, it will be good for our community. Uh, we, I believe that Lo South Los Angeles needs to bring new residents, new retail business, and hotels, since basically a lot of them are located in the central downtown. This will be great in South Los Angeles. Uh, also, the FIPRA is also committed to uh, hire local uh, construction workers and paying them liable wages. This is a very fantastic project, and I hope it will be granted permission to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, good afternoon. My name is Anel, and I support the FIG project. Um, the FIG project is a great project for South Los Angeles. I am very pleased and excited for the new residents to move into our community and for the hotel to open. South Los Angeles needs new residents and visitors to invest in our community by shopping locally instead of spending their money in other communities. Uh, we do hope the FIG hotel will attract thousands of visitors um, within the year. Thank you, and I hope you support the FIG project. Thank you. Let me just give a few more names here. Uh, Jasmine Matthews, Vanessa Harris, Lizzie Lopez, and Jelani Ariaga. Good afternoon, council members. I am here to inform you that I support the FIC project. Sorry, sir, would you identify yourself, please? Uh, my name is Eric. Good afternoon, council members. Um, I am here to inform you that I support the FIC project. We need more affordable housing for our community. The FIG project will create 82 new affordable housing units that our community really needs. The FIG project will create thousands of new construction jobs. Hopefully members of our community will be able to learn a construction trade while working on this project. I hope that you will approve this project. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jasmine Matthews. Um, good afternoon, council members. Housing is the number one issue for families in our communities. It seems like every day rent, uh, rental prices and home ownership prices are on the rise. I support the FIG project because we need new housing. This project will create 408 units of housing, including housing for students and 82 affordable units. This is a type of project that can help our community by providing local residents a place to live within their means. I hope you will strongly. I hope you will strongly considering um, approving the project because we have to tackle the housing issues before it gets even worse. I appreciate your leadership on this matter, and I hope you will approve the FIG project. Thank you. Thank you. Hello and dear council members, my name is Vanessa Eras. I would like to inform you guys to support our South Central community and prove the FIG project. Now is the time to invest in our community by allowing the FIG to construct new housing, retail, and new hotel in our neighborhood. Our community needs new investment and new affordable housing units. We're also looking forward to new hotel and retail stores that will be included at the FIG. Please take our neighborhood into account. Don't let this wonderful project fail. Please grant the FIG project permission to build their project. Thank you for your support of the FIG project. Thank you. A few more names as we, uh, as we go on. Lizzie Lopez, Jelani Arriaga, Rosalie Andrade, Angelica Pareto, Mizi Mogul. Hello, good afternoon, city council members. My name is Lizzie Lopez. Um, I am here to support the FIG project. I am happy to know that the new private investments is taking place in South Los Angeles, which is my community. I believe that we need new housing in our area and that the FIG project will create hundreds of new housing opportunities for this community. I am very happy that over 80 units of housing will be designated and affordable housing units for our community. Thank you for your anticipated support for the FIG project. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Council. I support the FIG project. Because Your name, sir? Oh, my name is Jelani Arriaga. 
we need good paying jobs in our community. The FIG project will help our community by hiring local residents to work on the construction of the FIG project. Construction jobs are good paying jobs that can help our families. We also look forward to the jobs that will be created by the hotel and retail spots created by the FIG project. We need this type of economic activity in our community to create a better future for our families. I believe this is a great project and I support it. Thank you for your support of the FIG project. Thank you. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Angelica Prieto, and I'm here to support the FIG. Our residents uh, need new affordable housing um, options. The FIG is a great example of a new project with micro rating um, housing, student housing, and affordable housing. Um, everyone, is, uh, everyone wins if you approve the FIG project. I hope you guys find it your heart to approve this project. Thank you. Angel Becerra, uh, Lydia Rosales, Rosalie Andrade, Mitzi Mogul, Todd Nelson, Jim Childs, Jean Frost, uh, Annie Marie Oatley, Mitzi Mogul. Please join us. Identify yourself, then you've got one minute. Thank you. My name is Lydia Rosales. I'm going to translate for her. Okay. That's fine. Okay. Her name is Lydia Rosales. She's very happy for the project at 39th and Figueroa Street. Because she is hoping that many people in the community will have uh, an affordable uh, rent to pay at these units. And she loves the fact that there's jobs that are going to be close by. Thank you for your support. Thank you. My name is Rosalie Andrade. I just strongly urge you to support the FIG project. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, it's, it's Jim Childs. Again, you called my name. I apologize for filling out two forms, but I get very confused with your electronic system. Thank you. I'm here representing the Neighborhood Council, so I would like to ask for a Neighborhood Council amount of time, if possible. Okay, that's uh, one minute. Okay, five minutes. I probably won't need that, but thank you okay. very much for your indulgence. I have six copies of my comments as per instructed today. I represent the... Please, please identify yourself, ma'am. Oh, Jean Frost... I live at 2341 Scarf Street, Los Angeles. I'm a 40-year resident of South LA. Um, we are the, um, the Empowerment Congress North Area Neighborhood Development Council. We've worked very successfully with our council members, including you, uh, Mr. Price, on the flyover. However, on this one, we do not support the demolition of the eight RSO uh, 32 units of housing. We have grave concerns about the kind of housing it is and the context that it brings to a, a neighborhood that is rich in history. We do support development on this site, and we support a towers alternative, which has been discussed, and there was consensus among the preservation community supporting multiple towers on this site that would bring to it all of the benefits that would accrue from this development and yet retain and save part of our very important history. We also believe that the failure of the EIR to include an analysis of this in the final EIR is a fatal flaw in terms of its legal sufficiency for the California Environmental Quality Act. We understand not every alternative is possible to be included, but this one was previously discussed and is a win-win solution for the developer and for the community. Um, the Towers alternative is something that really needs to be evaluated and placed in the EIR before it is certified. Um, we also think that there's no economic uh, feasibility investigation of Alternative 3, which was a scaled-down development. We're not necessarily supporting that. We're supporting the, the full development along with retaining the eight historic buildings. Uh, we also are concerned that there's no recognition of the sign district that has been recently created in the uh, EIR, it's, it's not included whatsoever, and we believe that may have an impact on the reluctance of city planning 
to consider a higher way of going in a higher density. Um, we also feel the, the EIR does not consider the impacts to the northerly section of the Flower Drive Historic District. Um, also, we understand there's recent changes in ownership that might make feasible um, a redesign and a different development uh, on this site and other adjacent parcels. So uh, we pray in order to get this speedily developed and to avoid an, an extended uh, dispute that the, the EIR at least analyze the tower's development and let the public and the people scrutinizing this know why the planning department decided to pancake what was originally a 21-story development into seven stories. It just doesn't make sense. It's not covered in the EIR. This EIR is not fundamentally adequate. And on behalf of the Neighborhood Council, who works very successfully with developers over many years, uh, this one misses the boat, and the EIR entirely misses the boat. We ask you not to approve this today in the hopes of finding a solution that we can all embrace, which will end up being a faster and quicker way of getting this built. Thank you very much. And Thank you for your I comments. I need the five minutes. My name is Mitzi Mogul. So to be determined eligible for the, net, for the state register is the same as being listed legally. The listing was not made formal because of uh, some owner's objections, but it is essentially a state historic district. This is a very big deal. Um, and to allow it to go forward without doing what Ms. Frost has suggested is the very essence of the slippery slope argument. If you allow a developer for personal gain to uh, simply come in and decimate a historic district that has undergone its own extensive scrutiny, then nothing will be safe. No historic district, no historic monument, and Lord only knows where it will all lead and where it will end. Um, the, let me just finish my... my thought with saying the people who are developing this project and those who are applauding have a vested interest in the outcome here. Those speaking are not under oath. I'm not under oath, but I don't have a vested interest. My interests are completely altruistic. So when they say follow the money, ask yourself, they have a reason to be telling you what they want you to know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Todd Nelson, Ann Utley, Natalie Schumann, Ricardo Marquez, Maria Espinoza, and Laura Myers. Hello, I'm Anne Marie Odie. I am representing the Los Angeles Orange County's Building and Construction Trades Council. We strongly support this project because of its provisions for those who have an interest in having a job and having a home. We appreciate the local hire, the project labor agreement that the developer has made with us, its commitment to union hiring for people from the local community to begin and flourish in their building trades careers. We also support their strong inclusion of affordable housing. So we see this developer as understanding those important needs of our city right now and that this project is fulfilling it. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, honorable council members. My name is Ricardo Marquez, and I'm a resident of the community. I'm a college student, and I'm a member of my community. I'm here today to support the FIG project because it's a project for the students. It has over 200 affordable housing. Um, I'm sorry, for the students, it has um, over 80 units for the families. This is a time where um, you should all listen to all of us because it will boost the community. I urge you, and, and with all respect, to support the project. I also want to keep in fact that there is an investment in communities, on the youth and the future. I also want to keep in track that I know the project because of people like Johnny Andrade and others who are keeping in track with all of us. I'd like to thank um, current Price for the support as well. And I are, um, actually enjoy it, um, living here. I want to continue living here and to do so. i like to see other projects like this being approved and to continue to give us the means and ways to improve ourselves. Thank you. Have a nice day.
Thank you. I'm going to translate for her, that's okay. Okay. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Concejales. Council members. Mi nombre es María Espinosa. Soy residente de la comunidad de Sur Centro. She's resident of the community. La diferencia de muchos aquí es que no, yo vivo en el área. The difference is that I live in the area. Es un cambio que se está haciendo en nuestra comunidad. It's a difference that's changing in the community. Y gracias a nuestro concejal que está haciendo esos cambios. Thank you for the council for making the changes. El proyecto FIF va a traer trabajos, muchos recursos para nuestras familias, para nuestros hijos. The FIF project will bring a lot of resources for the families and to, our, and to the kids. Que nuestra comunidad necesita a gritos. The community urgently needs. Para aquí los que se están oponiendo al proyecto FIF, to those who are opposing the project, les pido que crean en el cambio. Ese es un gran cambio para nuestra comunidad. I ask you all to believe in the change. It's a change for the community. Porque nosotros vivimos en la comunidad. Because, because we live in a community. Muchos que nada más vienen uh, de visita o trabajan aquí y se van a sus casas, buenas casas que tengan, buenas áreas. To those who oppose, they just work here. They don't live here. We do. Pero yo quiero ese cambio para mi comunidad, para mis hijos, para mi familia, porque yo vivo en esta área. But I want the change for my families, for my kids, and for everyone, because I, she lives in the area. Yo vengo aquí para apoyar este proyecto. She comes here to support the project. Y le pido a mi concejal, el señor Pry, que siga trayendo esos buenos proyectos a mi área. And I ask Councilor Price to please approve the project and to continue to bring these resources to the um, community. Y le agradezco de todo corazón que tenga siempre en mente a su comunidad. And I'm thankful for to keep the support of the community in, in their loop. Y le agradezco también al señor Andrade porque siempre está comunicándole todo a mi comunidad. And to also thank Mr. Andrade for keeping the community in loop. Muchas gracias. Que tengan buena tarde. Thank you very much. Have a nice Thank day. you. Good afternoon. My name is Natalie Schumann. I'm here with Unite Here Local 11, and I urge you to approve this project today. This project will bring much needed housing, including affordable units, to the area. Our members report spending 50 to 75 percent of their income on rent and want to see more affordable units in our city. Adding a, a net total of 50 affordable units to the market is an important step in addressing the impacts of this crisis. We urge you to support the project. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Um, hello, I'm Laura Myers. I'm here representing the North University Park Community Association. I served for 25 years on the Community Redevelopment Agency's Project Area Advisory Committee for this area. Um, it is possible to support the entire project and oppose the demolition of 32 rent-stabilized units, the loss of housing for 32 families. They mentioned that they've been in negotiation. Yep, strong-armed. They have done no maintenance on the buildings. The people are getting fifty, sixty thousand dollars sounds like a lot. However, what they're learning is that might last for five years with the increased rents they're facing. This is a historic district. It is possible to redesign this whole project to include everything they want and keep 32 families or their successors working class families in their housing. These people will not be eligible for the laudable affordable housing that they're going to include in, in this project. So I'm a favor of the project, but redesigned. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Todd Nelson, last speaker. Thank you, sir. Todd Nelson spoke earlier on behalf of the applicant. Uh, no need to speak again, but available to answer any questions the committee might have. Okay, thank you. That, uh, that will include our public comment on this item. Uh, since this uh, project is in my district. Let me uh, uh, just make a few, few remarks. Uh, first of all, I, I support this project due to the overwhelming number of community benefits that the project is going to bring to South LA. This includes over 400 units of new housing with 20 percent of these units being dedicated to affordable. The project will also offer union jobs with a goal of 30 percent local hire. In all, we're looking at the creation of about 100 about 1,100 full and part-time construction jobs, 
and 440 permanent jobs in the hotel, retail, and security industries. The city will also benefit from the potential tax revenues to the city of more than $5.5 million annually. Uh, with that said, I'm proud, as I said, to uh, welcome the, the FIG into the new ninth, uh, and we look forward to its uh, successful operation. Uh, but with that, let me uh, ask planning staff to respond to uh, any specific public comments that were made. Thank you. This is Melena Zasajin with the Department of City Planning. Um, in response to some of the comments from the Appellant and Neighborhood Council and other commenters, to clarify, there aren't eight buildings to be demolished. The applicant will be relocating three of the structures. Um, one of the structures to be demolished is not a contributor, and then four of them are expected to be demolished. Um, in addition, the appellants note that there will be a demolition of 32 rent stabilized units. However, that will be replaced with the 82 affordable housing units. Um, there's also no plan to demolish the 11 buildings that are offsite to the north of the project. Um, these significant impacts to historic resources were fully disclosed in the environmental process. Um, in response, the city adopted a statement of overriding considerations determining that the project benefits outweigh the, the significant impacts of the project. Regarding the numerous comments about the 21-story alternative, uh, we responded to this comment several times in the record, including in the final EIR and in numerous staff reports. The 21-story alternative is most similar to the full preservation alternative, alternative two, which we analyzed and disclosed in the EIR. Uh, the full preservation alternative would have maintained the eight houses and then had a development footprint on the remaining portion of the site, which would be very similar to the 21-story alternative. The only difference is whether the tower would be a low tower or high tower. So um, as detailed in the EIR and the CEQA findings, the alternative would not meet all the project ob objectives. And in addition, various components of the project would not be feasible because of the constraints of the reduced development site. Um, lastly, to clarify, there is no sign district on the site. Uh, therefore, we can, uh, recommend denial of the appeals and approval of the project with the modified Q conditions requested by the applicant with the modified site plan condition um, as requested by Metro. Okay, members, any, uh, any comments or questions at this point? Based on all the uh, testimony that we received this, this uh, afternoon, I'm going to move that we deny the appeals filed by Michael Sai on behalf of uh, SAJE and Jim Childs on behalf of Los Angeles Heritage Association and sustain the Planning Commission's determination in certifying the FIGS project EIR and the adoption of the Statement of Overriding Considerations, Mitigation Monitoring Program, Mitigation Measures, and Related CEQA Findings, and Investing uh, a Tentative Track Map. Additionally, I'm uh, moving that we deny the appeals fi by, filed by Michael uh, Sai on behalf of, of SAGE uh, and Jim Childs on behalf of West Angeles Heritage Association, and sustain the Plum Committee's determination in the previously certified EIR and related CEQA findings for the project located at 3900 South Figueroa Street, 3901 through 3968, I'm sorry, 3969 South Flower Drive, and 40, 450 West 39th Street, and approve the conditional use permit, a master conditional use permit, a zoning administer adjustment, and a site plan review for the project for the project located at 3900 South Figueroa Street, 3901 through 3969 South Flower Drive, and 450 West 39th Street. If there are no objections, that will be the order. Thank you. Is there a second? Okay. Um, okay I'll, I'll accept that second. In, a, in addition, Councilman, to the to the queues and the site plan review conditions. Correct. Submitted by the planning department. Okay. Thank you. That, without objection, that will be the order. Okay. In, um, out of respect for those of you who came to, uh, on item six, although we're not taking the vote at this time, uh, we are going to provide you with an opportunity to uh, make any comments that you wish to make at this time. And so if uh, Margarita, uh, Jerebeck is here, uh, Ben Resnick, 
Bruce Phillips, Keith Nakata, Mary Louise, Bruce Block. And Councilman, President, please come forward. Councilman, just to be clear, we're going to be doing the public hearing for public comment, rather, for item six, which is the cultural heritage report relative to the inclusion of Tom Bergen's um, as a historic cultural monument in CD4. Adrian Corsani, City Attorney's Office. This item was continued to May 28th. This is only public comment. Public comment will be taken again when this item is heard by the committee. Okay, thank you. Chair, before you run my time, I just need a clarification because many people had left, including our expert. Yes. Um, when you first announced that this item is being continued, so we don't have our expert here, and I understand you're taking I, I apologize for that. Um, the question I have is next Tuesday, when many of us are not available, my understanding is you're going to continue the item to uh, an exercise of 15 day extension the council has a right to do so that the item will be continued to a date specific, which is June 18th. And I just want to confirm that so that we know we don't have to be here next Tuesday. Okay. Can we get can, a confirmation uh, on that? Hold on. Hold on. Let, me get you, let me get some clarification on that matter. City Attorney to clarify. Adrian Corsani, City Attorney's Office. My understanding is that is the intent for next week. The item will be called so that Council can uh, make its recommendation on a motion to continue the item for 15 days per the code. Admin code. Okay. Okay, well, thank, thank you for that one minute, sir. Th thank you, Chair Price. Uh, ben Resnick representing the property owner. I'm sorry, so, what's the name, sir? Ben Resnick. Ben. ben Resnick. So the question is, what is before you? So, so there was a nomination made for this bar restaurant. It's actually a bar. It hasn't been a restaurant for a long time. But a nomination was made to, for, for it to be an architectural historical monument. That was flatly rejected by the Cultural Heritage Commission. That's not before you. That's dead. That doesn't proceed. The only item that did come before you is this notion that the restaurant bar, the bar is a legacy business, some sort of a business that's worthy of it being a monument in LA. And so I want to make sure that's clear because there's no definition in the city codes for anything like that. What the city code defines a monument as is, a, and I'm quoting, is any site, including trees and plants, buildings or structures of particular historical or cultural significance to the city. A business is none of those. And if you designate a business as a site, you're effectively doing an end run around the fact that it's not an architectural monument. And yet it is being suggested as, as, a, as, a, as a business. And, and last thing, I do want to say this, and I know that you're going to run short on time here, yes. but we, I, I'm not sure when we're going to get our, our public hearing. But what's being designated here is a bar based on an old, they say an old liquor license. I don't see how we identify LA with necessarily as a cultural monument for Thank bars you. and drinking and alcohol. I mean, that's not what we celebrate in the city. And I can tell you as a father of a son who is eight okay. years sober and a wife who's chair of a nonprofit that is a, a, a recovery, alcoholic addiction recovery center, we find it offensive that this has even gone this far, that right, you would consider you designating something and celebrating LA's history with drinking and, and, and the notion of alcoholism as a celebratory item. Thank you, Thank sir. You. Thanks for your comments. Next. Uh, good afternoon. Keith Nakata. I'm the uh, current co-chair of the Mid-City West Community Council Planning and Land Use Committee until tonight's meeting. That'll be the end of the term. Uh, I'm just making personal comments in support of the designation of Tom Bergens as a historical cultural monument. And let me set the record straight. The Cultural Heritage Commission voted five to zero in support of this nomination. We've uh, received 
over 1,300 emails uh, that were submitted to the Cultural Heritage Commission in support of this designation. So there is strong uh, community support and there is uh, strong support from the council member. Um, this nomination was prepared by a top tier historic resource consultant, architectural resources group. They've done work for, for uh, actually our city. They've actually uh, done work on Union Station, uh, Pasadena City Hall, Huntington Library, to name a few. So thank you. Thank you, sir, for your comments. My name is Bruce Phillips. Thank you for taking uh, time for these comments. I personally canceled a consulting trip to Washington, D.C. so I could be here, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Uh, we moved to the neighborhood in 1978. Tom Bergen's was the only restaurant for blocks around. We ate there regularly until the restaurant closed, uh, even when the food stopped being so good, just to support that business. Um, and it really, the business, the restaurant part only closed. It's really been, an, it has been an iconic institution. It was, as I mentioned, the only restaurant there for decades. When the department stores closed, other stores closed. And my own family's business opened in Los Angeles the same year as Tom Bergen's, 1936 Phillips Music Company in East Los Angeles. Uh, it's been the subject of... Uh, public city celebrations, as well as research projects at USC where I teach. And I believe it is important to keep some of our historic businesses around. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Louise, Bruce Block, David Mann, Ken Hickson, Tracy Landers, Anna Brooks, uh, Mary Louise Monahan and I was one of the patrons of uh, Tom Bergen's Down Through the Years and uh, I also live in the neighborhood. I own a 1925 home and um, I, like some of the other people that have spoken before about the land use in South Central and so on, uh, you know, it would be really wonderful if LA started respecting and keeping uh, some of its historic uh, places and I feel Tom Bergen's definitely is with the shamrocks up in the bar that have been there forever and uh, I've also got a lot of pins that date back to you know the 80s and um, so I hope that you um, will approve it as being an historical uh, monument. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ken Hickson. I'm vice president of the Miracle Mile Residential Association. Some of the names you've called, these people have left in the confusion of thinking the meeting had been canceled, and now we're able to give testimony. I'm happy to be here on behalf of the residents of the Miracle Mile and the over 1,300 individuals who sent messages of support to Councilman Rue's office and to the Cultural Heritage Commission. I'm also pleased to see that Mid-City West Neighborhood Council supports this, as does Pico Neighborhood Council, as does Lynn Cohen, the president of the Miracle Mile Civic Coalition. Tom Bergen's is a landmark in the minds of thousands and thousands of people in Los Angeles. It's time to make it official. Thank you. Thank you. My name's Tracy Landers. I'm also a patron of Tom Bergen's and am in support of it being historical. Um, it's a neighborhood area that we all in, could uh, gather and meet friends and family. And I've met three quarters of my friends in LA at that establishment. Um, and there's been couples that have made there and everything, but the story I wanted to tell you was one of my friend that can't be here. Her parents got married right before the war and he went off to the war and they, they knew Tom, they were uh, frequenters of Tom Bergen's. So they would call, they had a designated time, they would call the phone booth of Tom Bergen's and the uncle and the wife would be there and feed co coins into it so that they could talk. And, and, to me, and that was their meeting place. And then after my friend was born, her first time taken out of the house was to Tom Bergen's. So there's been many families that have been grown out of the love of Tom Bergen's and just that family neighborhood establishment that I think we should keep because it's, it's gone now. Thank okay, you. thank you. Again, Bruce Phillips, 
uh, Bruce Block, David Mann, Anna, Anna Marie Brooks, uh, Kevin Glenn, Adam Scott, um, Derek Schrick, Anna Marie Hare, Tana. Bruce Phillips already used my minute, so. Okay. Uh, let's see where we are here. Anna Kawano, Laura Cohen, Yes, good afternoon. My name is Kevin Glenn. I live in the Miracle Mile area, and I'm for um, naming Tom's Bergen as a cultural monument. Here in the city of Los Angeles, we have uh, Places such as Little Ethiopia, Koreatown, we have African American museums, we have the Jewish Holocaust Museum, we have uh, Hispanic Heritage Month, we have Pacific Islanders Month, but they're, given the contributions of the Irish and the Irish Americans to the city of Los Angeles, there's only a little wee spot of heaven, and that's Tom's Bergen's. And uh, I think that as an overall nod to the Irish American community here in Los Angeles, that it would behoove the city council uh, to to give whatever consideration we can to Tom Bergen's and the present owners and to make it possible to keep Tom Bergen's like uh, uh, that little green shamrock glowing in the middle of the night so that uh, people can know where to go and, uh, and meet each other and become friends. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Hana Kawano. I'm in support of Tom Berrigan's being a cultural monument. I'm speaking on behalf of myself and all the people that they had to leave. Thank you very much. And once again, in support of. Okay, thank you. Hello, and thank you for your time. I'm Laura Cohen. I live in the neighborhood of Tom Bergen's, and I oppose the designation of historical landmark. I purchased a house in this neighborhood so that my children would have the freedom and the security to walk on their own, be independent, be able to go to the Grove and be social. There is another landmark on the corner of Wilshire and Fairfax that was designated as historical, and that is a blight in our community. It is closed, it has homelessness, it has garbage, it has human feces, and I am not exaggerating when I say hypodermic needles. Now my children have to cross this street in order to get to their designated social areas. And I am very fearful and I strongly believe that this is exactly what would happen to Tom Bergen's should it become historical. The community spoke, it was a failed business. Not enough of these impassioned people came and supported it when it was open. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Derek Schreck. I'm the current owner of Tom Bergen's. Thank you for your time today. Um, I, I would like to first say that uh, I completely understand the passion behind Tom Bergen's, but it's also important for this council to realize that the building has been empty for a year and a half and it's been closed for 40% of the last decade. It is not currently a, an operating business, nor can you landmark a business as such. Um, I think people are under the, uh, uh, the misunderstanding that by nominating this that it's somehow magically going to reopen and that's simply not the case. And so the article before you is not whether or not you are going to somehow uh, nominate something that's going to preserve uh, or persevere. It's the case that you have to take a look at what would be the best use of this empty site for the community. There is a school uh, next door that wanted to use it for campuses, that we have a housing shortage in this community. There are other things that can be used uh, on this site rather than what it is right now, which is an abandoned building. So I ask you to deny this nomination. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Let, let me ask uh, anyone else who'd like to speak on this item to just come to the mic. Let's, yeah, okay, let's just go through the names again. David Mann, Anna Brooks, Adrian Fine, uh, John Wellborn, David Passman, Daryl Siegel, Michael Pio, Michael Pellergren, David Kendall, Amy Gauntlet, Stephen Luffman, Christy McCollum, Tina Choi, 
and Wayne Berger, Jr. in that order. Thank you. My name is James O'Sullivan. I filled out one of those electronic cards. You never missed them when we had the cards. Anyway, I'm the president of the Miracle Mile Residential Association. This nomination is not about alcoholism. It is not about detox centers. In June of 2002, the Mid-City West Community Council was certified, 37th Neighborhood Council, to a person. The place they wanted to go to celebrate was Bergen's. And so we went to Bergen's. I was sober about 22 years at the time. I sat at the bar and had a cup of coffee. I was never tempted to have a glass of alcohol. It's not about that. It's about a historical part of the Miracle Mile. And you need to preserve it. And by the way, if the city attorney is worried about that money that Mid-City West was supposed to pay, the Miracle Mile Residential Association will fulfill that. They did the work, we'll pay in them. And if they don't, I'll write it out of my check. And I am so embarrassed for David Rue and the council office that this has happened. This is unconscionable. Stephen Luftman. Um, I'd like to point out that the Cultural Heritage Commission uh, made the findings that Bergen's meets the criteria for a historic cultural monument. In fact, everyone I've spoken to thought Bergen's already was a cultural a, a monument. Up until a few months ago, even Bergen's website basically said that this was a monument. Please make this a monument in real. Thank you. Thank you. Tana Key, um, I oppose this nomination and I'm here reading a letter from a local who could not be here. I started drinking at Tom Bergen shortly after I moved to LA. I now live directly across the street. I had the pleasure of knowing Bergen's current owner. From our numerous conversations, I know Derek has done everything in his power and used every resource at his disposal to keep Bergen's open. The MMRA's action is keeping now a closed, empty, and unused building closed, empty, and unused. They seem fixated on the image of an old style Irish pub and on their memories of having gone there some time ago, not on current realities. There has been no acknowledgement of the cost of keeping Bergen's open, operating as a go concern in its current location with its current mortgage and expenses. Allowing the designation will not reopen Bergen's. It will instead create a blight on the neighborhood, a definite security and safety risk, and keep the building closed, empty, and unused. Denying the designation will allow Derek to sell everything inside that made Bergen's Bergen's back to the Bergen family so that they could move it yet again. It will also give Eric the right to sell his property as he sees fit without encroachments. Thank you. Thank you. What was your name, ma'am? Tana Key. Okay. Thank you. The letter has also been submitted to the council electronically. Okay, thank you very much. Next, please. Hi, my name is Christy McCollum. Um, I'm here to uh, disapprove of this designation. I love Tom Bergen's as much as anybody here. I was a regular there for years. I met my boyfriend there last St. Patrick's Day at the last big blowout. I think the people supporting this historical designation support it because they think it will keep Bergen's alive. But unfortunately, it won't. Bergen's is already closed. There's no business to save. The alternative to this designation isn't a thriving historical bar. It's a vacant building that the owner can't sell and can't afford to operate, so it's just blight. Bergen's has closed three times under three owners in the last decade. It's been closed a lot, and a number of owners, including Derek, have tried everything they can to keep it alive, but unfortunately, it's just not a viable location. So Derek can't afford to keep the business open, but he can't sell because nobody will consider buying it with this pending designation. They don't know what they can do with it. Would you buy a home if you were told that you could never redecorate and never remodel? No. So nobody's buying it. The practical result of the designation won't be a thriving bar. It'll be a vacant bar. I encourage you to disapprove this. Thank you. Thanks for your comments. Good afternoon, Council Members. Adrian Scott Fine with the Los Angeles Conservancy. I'm here on behalf of our organization and our many supporters that are supporting this nomination. We are a co-applicant for this with the Miracle Mile Residential Association. This is a significant cultural landmark to Los Angeles, uh, important legacy business. Uh, we will be back here on the 28th and whatever date follows that. Thank you for your support. Thank you. Hello, my name is Michael Pellerin. I'm a 30-year uh, patron of Tom Bergen's and its various iterations. Um, I'm also a resident of Hollywood. Um, and one of the things about Tom Bergen's is I have photos from 30 years ago and photos from two years ago is when it shuttered. And it's basically the same. It's a place that you can go to and there's a piece of history that's there in LA and we so desperately need that. 
I'm a resident of Hollywood, and we have places there like the Rollin B. Lane Mansion, the Magic Castle, the Yamashiro, the old Bernheimer Estate, uh, Musso and Franks, all of which saw hard times, all of which almost ended. And thank God they didn't, because we have those cultural landmarks in our neighborhood, which makes a wonderful, wonderful place for LA to be in. I also want to mention that where Tom Bergens exists, and I'm sure you all know this, is about to be the opening place of the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures. There's going to be the eventual LACMA extension. It's going to have the Metro Hub. This is about to become one of the hubs of Los Angeles. Whatever is going to go there is going to thrive, whether they tear it down or not. My name is Amy Galladay, and I'm on the board of Beverly Wilshire Homeowners, and we support that Bergen's become a cultural heritage. Also, it is a beautiful building, and to be tearing down beauty that we will never see again is almost like tossing and trashing a turner. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Dale Kendall, I'm here. I'm a board member of Safe Beverly Fairfax. We're in support of Tom Bergen's and making it a, a cultural monument. Um, I've been going there since I was a kid with family. Our family never thought of it as a bar. We thought of it as a family restaurant that you went to have a birthday party, an anniversary. Never thought of it as just a bar. It was more of a restaurant. Um, this is a very special building. Um, it's a special place like the Formosa restaurant that's just been revitalized, just becoming a historic building. These are very, very few of them still exist. And this is one of the ones that we really should save. It's an Irish pub type of a restaurant, and there are very few of them. So I really encourage you to save this historic building. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is David Passman. I've been the real estate agent for 840 South Fairfax Avenue. Over the last eight years, there have been three owners of the business at the property, and unfortunately, the business has not been able to stay open. We had interested third parties prior to the nomination, and because of the nomination, it would be very difficult to market this property because of the potential limitations on the use of the property. Also, as I had indicated before at a prior meeting, I strongly oppose this nomination. Good afternoon. My name is Darren. I'm by nominating this. I'm culturally, sorry, Darren. My name is Darren Siegel. Okay. Uh, by nominating this culturally, it can block meaningful future development in the area. What has happened here has been a misapplication of the definition of historical cultural locations. I oppose the nomination because it's based upon the interpretation of what cultural heritage means, which is not justified. There is no cultural experience. It's a drinking establishment. And if it's just because it's been there for a long time, it should not qualify as cultural. To do so, there are hundreds of other locations in the city that would then qualify as cultural historical monuments. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Joe Steins, and I've worked on the electronic board seven times. So, <laughs> but I've lived in the area for 49 years. I'm about nine blocks from the restaurant. I always considered it a restaurant. I took family members there for celebrations, members of my church, and uh, professional clients. It was always a pleasant, pleasant time. I would encourage you to support it. I'm not an expert, but I think the people on the HCM are, and they already made that determination. So I hope you will support it. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm John Wellborn. I'm a, a stakeholder in the uh, uh, adjani adjacent uh, Greater Wilshire Neighborhood Council. I really came here for two reasons today. One, to see how many people showed up, and two, to thank you, distinguished council members, for listening to what the people have to say on both sides. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm David Mann, a second generation resident of the Miracle Mile. Uh, I'd like to say that uh, with the rather amazing development of the uh, intersection of La Brea, uh, sorry, of, uh, of Wilshire and Fairfax, these are the three museums that are going online, 
there's going to be an extraordinary amount of people coming from all over the world. I, I'm calling it the, the will be the most famous art intersection in the world, and it seems to me Tom Bergen's being only a block and a half away that uh, the owner may want to give it another go uh, because I think the volume of business and patrons uh, will be enormous. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Tina Choi. So this building has basically um, been through about $300,000 worth of tenant renovations. And most of it is from my client, Derek, who tried to keep it up. But unfortunately, in that process, about 80% of the building has been replaced with Home Depot and Lowe's products. The architectural um, staff, the historic staff, as well as the commission, agree there's no architectural significance to this building. It may look great, it may look like an Irish bar, but a lot of that stuff was basically um, bought and purchased in modern times. Second, Derek has been working with Joe Bergen, who you might hear from today, if not next Tuesday. He's the grandson of the Bergen family. They've been working together to try to figure out how to joint venture and move this bar to another location where it's viable. That cannot happen if this monument designation goes through. This is Derek's only financial asset and property, and if you do this to him, he basically will be financially strapped, landlocked, without, as you heard from the previous um, um, speakers, any ability to sell or market or use this site. So please th take this into consideration. There are other uses for this site, like affordable housing or the school expansion next Thank door. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Frank Schreck. I'm Derek's father. I'm a co-owner of Bergen's, and I'd like to have your deference to let me read a prepared statement that I have, and I'll go through it as quickly as I can, but it may be longer than a minute. Okay. Quickly, please. About six years ago, Derek contacted me and advised me that his neighborhood bar, Tom Bergen's, which I had visited with him, was closing only after being reopened for 11 months by a successful restaurateur that owned three restaurants in L.A., and he couldn't make a go of it, and it was for sale. After checking with advisors that the property had no historical designation, it was outside a historical preservation zone, the building exterior had been significantly remodeled, and the interior had been gutted and rebuilt, it was the consensus that the building would not satisfy the requirements for designation as an historical architectural monument, and it didn't. It was, it was denied. Uh, nor would it qualify as a cultural monument since it was merely a drinking establishment where no significant cultural events occurred. We then purchased the property and put our hearts and money into making Bergen's a success. Unfortunately, after four and a half years and several million dollars, we learned the hard lesson that the two preceding owners had learned. An Irish pub at that location cannot be financially viable. Our only alternative was to close Tom Bergen's and sell the property. Just prior to selling the property, the petition to before you to nominate Bergen's as a historical monument was filed. Needless to say, after the petition was filed, there was no interest by any third party in purchasing Bergen's. The petition request that Bergen be designated as a historic, historic architectural monument was rejected by the Cultural Heritage Commission. However, it did recommend the property be designated as a historical cultural monument. The effect of such a designation is as follows, because you may not know the breadth of it. If, if you can wrap it up, sir, I know you're... Pardon? If you can wrap it up, I know you've got a no, statement. Uh, please let me finish. I've got millions of dollars at stake here. Even though the building was determined to be the Cultural Heritage Commission to have no architectural significance and was not recommended as an architectural monument, I'm advised that we still have to maintain the building because of the cultural experience inside the building. The experience inside Bill Bergen's is not cultural. It's drinking and eating. And that's what everybody that testified here today and testified before the commission. They love to go there to drink and eat. Unfortunately, they didn't do it enough times to make it viable. There was no cultural experience defined. This was no cultural experience as defined in your code. I'm also advised that we need to maintain the interior of the building, even though 90% of the interior is less than 90 per, is less than six years old. We were further advised that any development on the parking lot is going to be limited by the requirements that the building has to be seen, though it was determined it has no architectural significance whatsoever. The reality of this situation is because of the nomination, my bank would not renew the mortgage on the property. Instead, it provided me with a multi-million dollar short-term loan. I'm 75 years old, so far a survivor of prostate cancer, and preparing to retire in a few years. I am now going to have to cash in my retirement plan to pay off the personal note if this nomination is agreed to. 
Needless to say, I will have not have funds to maintain Tom Bergen's, and it will become like Johnny's. The unfortunate choice is that Tom Bergen's will be sh a shuttered building and an, attract and an attraction for the homeless like Johnny's up the street. I'm at a loss to understand why such a sad sight will be able to generate fond memories of Bergen's. Yeah. On the other hand, the property could be repo repurposed for much needed housing, which is a positive contribution to the community. Okay, so I'm and consistent, you to I'm almost done, consistent with the multifamily development surrounding the property. Derek and I tried our best. Please don't punish me financially by approving this nomination. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for your comments. Okay, we have a Wayne Berger, Michael Poe, Frank Shrek, who just spoke. Yes, bloody hell. And I'm sorry, sir, you had an opportunity to speak earlier. I am trying, I'm trying to please, speak about these. Please, let me ask you to take your seat. Wayne Berger is me. You let this man speak for six minutes. Please, please take your seat. Sir, would you like to take your seat or would you like to leave the room? Either or. Take your seat or leave the room. Pete, you gave this guy six minutes. All right. You reopened public comment. Sir, you have a choice. Would you, would you remove him off, sir? I think, he, I think he's ready to leave. I think he's ready to leave the room. All right. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments on this item? I just want to apologize for the confusion that resulted in several people leaving. I apologize for those who weren't able to speak at this meeting. However, you, there will be an opportunity uh, next week on the 28th. And so with that, we will close the public comment on this item. Okay, Mr. CLA, what is our next item, please? Um, Councilman, you have item five, which is a commissioner. I don't know if you want to take that before the uh, three appeals. Uh, and then yes. You. So item five, Councilman, this is a communication from the mayor rel relative to the appointment of Ms. Amber Ginsburg to the Harbor Area Planning Commission. And I believe she's still here. Okay, Ms. Ginsburg, are you with us? Please uh, join us at the table. Still with us. That's <laughs> okay, Ms. Ginsburg, Ms. Ginsburg, please introduce yourself and tell us about your experience uh, and goals as a member of the Harbor Area Planning Commission. Absolutely. Thank you. Good afternoon, council members. I'm Amber Sheet Ginsburg. My career and personal life thus far has been dedicated to equity and ensuring our institutions and community organizations are serving the needs of our community in an inclusive and strengths-based manner. I believe that our LA communities are rich in assets, in strengths, and I hope to leverage those to help support more equitable and organic community development. My lifelong involvement with Council District 15 and Los Angeles runs deep. My parents met in Harbor City shortly after immigrating to this country, bought their first house in Harbor Gateway, and owned a small family business that was headquartered in Harbor City and then Wilmington for 25 years. I currently live in San Pedro with my husband and two young kids, and CD15 is where my family realized the American dream. I believe that development should be an articulation of the community that, we, that we'll utilize it now with a strong eye to the future. And if I may, on a more sentimental note, I love this city deeply and would be honored and proud to serve. I'm a proponent of equitable and affordable community development and housing. Any questions? Well, thank you for your comments and your willingness to, uh, to share your, your skills and your interests with our city. I know it is greatly appreciated. Uh, members, any comments or thoughts? Hey, seeing none, uh, we will uh, approve your uh, recommendation to the council for approval. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Next item. Um, Councilman, item seven, this is a sequel appeal relative to the uh, approval of the categorical exemption. Uh, it's an appeal filed by Doug Haynes, Charles Fisher, and Alex Kondracki, um, and it relates to the demo of uh, two existing duplexes for the construction of a surface parking lot in CD13. 
Okay, uh, Jason Hernandez. Yes, sir. From the uh, planning staff. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Jason Hernandez with City Planning, a joint sequel appeal for case number ENV 2017-5248-CE was filed regarding the directors of planning's decision to determine that the project is categorically exempt from the environmental review pursuant to state sequel guidelines, Article 19, Class 15301, and City of Los Angeles sequel guidelines, Article 3, Section 1, Class 11, Category 2. The appeals mainly rely on the same arguments and information as presented in the appellant's previous letters to the city and first level appeal of case number DIR 2017-5247-SPP as stated in staff's response letter to the Plum Committee dated May 15, 2019. The city has already adequately provided detailed and full responses to each of the appeal points in the central APC appeal report dated July 10, 2018. Nonetheless, the following represents a summary of the response given by staff for the sequel appeal points. First appeal point, the city has imposed an improper standard of review for what constitutes substantial evidence. The appellants claim that the oral testimony given by Charles J. Fisher constitutes as substantial evidence. However, Charles J. Fisher does not meet the Secretary of Interior's professional qualification standards for historic preservation that a person must meet when completing historic resources surveys and impacts assessments. As such, the fair argument standard does not govern determinations whether the discretionary historical resources exception applies to a category exemption. Second appeal point, the project site contains a historic resource. The appellant contends that the two craftsman duplexes were considered historic and the category exemption was granted without proper analysis. The project site is not identified as historic or listed on the National Register, California Register, City of Los Angeles Historic Cultural Monuments, or HPOZ. The subject site is not designated under any local, state, or federal program, was not identified in Survey LA or any other survey, and is not a historic resource as defined by CEQA. The appellant has not provided any substantial evidence such as field surveys and research conducted by a qualified professional cultural resource consultant to determine whether duplexes are indeed historic. In conclusion, no new substantial evidence was presented that city has erred in its actions relative to the categorical exemption. The project opponent has the burden of producing substantial evidence showing a reasonable possibility of adverse environmental impact sufficient to remove the project from the categorical exempt class. Again, the fair argument standard does not apply to the question of whether the buildings are historic resources for purposes of CEQA and is inconsistent with the concept of a lead agency's discretion to determine that a property is a historical resource. Therefore, the CEQA field should be denied and the actions of the Central Area Planning Commission should be sustained. This concludes staff presentation. We're available for any questions you may have. Okay, thank you. We uh, will now hear from the appellant, Doug Haynes. We have five minutes. Can we get some? You're just, can you hear me? Hold, hold on a second, sir. Okay. You, okay. Okay. Can you restart the clock, please? My name is Doug Haynes. I'm going to be speaking on part of this, and then Charlie Fisher will add additional evidence. I wanted to make you aware we've submitted a number of letters and also photographs for you to review while we're speaking. This appeal, which has taken almost 10 months to be heard, involves the demolition of what were two potentially significant craftsman duplexes dated 1910 and 1916. The site received approval in 2018 for a 20-stall surface parking lot that was to be paved and landscaped, surrounded by wrought iron fencing, and, and have no physical structures on the site. This appeal also involves the piecemealing of the ongoing construction activity in, at, by Hollywood Presbyterian Hospital, which purchased the lot in 2016. Hollywood Presbyterian Hospital previously received approval in 2015 for the construction of a 654 stall parking garage and in 2016 for a 135,000 square foot hospital addition. These projects are tied together with the approved service parking lot, yet planning staff has approved piecemeal review of the whole of the action rather than properly requiring an environmental impact report to assess the overall impacts. This issue has been completely ignored by staff. On July 26, 2018, La Mirada filed a timely sequel appeal of the planning department's approvals, yet on August 29, the planning department issued clearances anyway for the demolition of the two duplexes on the project site. Subsequently, on August 30, Building and Safety issued a per demolition permit and the duplexes were destroyed. 
The site has not been developed as approved, which is for the 20 stall paved and landscaped surface parking lot with wrought iron fencing, no physical structures and buried utility lines. Instead, the site now has two modular construction office buildings placed on the dirt lot surrounded by chain link fencing topped with barbed wire and with a temp power pole. The use of the site is therefore completely illegal under its conditions of approval, yet planning staff has chosen to turn a blind eye to this. The city issued demolition clearances despite the City Planning Commission's approval on August 30, a proposed CEQA appeal ordinance that requires a stay on all building permits and other project sign-offs while CEQA appeal is pending. The proposed stay on the issuance of permits while an appeal is pending was also approved by this committee on October 30. It is fundamental that once an agency determines that an activity is subject to CEQA, that it must not allow any action until it renders a decision on the case. The city determined that the project was discretionary and subject to CEQA, but that it was exempt. La Mirada appealed this decision to the elected decision-making body as allowed under state law, yet the planning department issued demolition permits anyway and the duplexes were destroyed. This violates CEQA and La Mirada's equal protection rights. It's important to note that the planning department's clearances of demolition and construction permits while CEQA appeals are pending is an unwritten policy that is left to the individual planner to follow. It is therefore arbitrary and capricious, clearly undermining the ability of an objector to an administrative decision to obtain a fair hearing, therefore making this process entirely futile. Now Charlie's going to speak on the additional time, if you could hold it please, about the historic nature of the site. Okay, I'm not going to go into the historic nature as much as uh, the fact that this particular issue has assaulted my own credentials as a historian. I have been a historian for over 35, almost 35 years. I have written, advocated, and uh, followed through on over 160 of the Los Angeles Historic Cultural Monuments over the last uh, 35 years. And um, what happened is when this came up, they said, oh, but he doesn't have a degree. Well, the degree wasn't even offered when I started doing this. And to add to that, I kind of felt that the planner that brought that up was probably a toddler at the time I started doing this work. Um, what I've been basically saying is I felt that it was an assault on my own credentials. I've turned in numerous reports during the CRA period. I turned in numerous reports for both developers and others on properties, uh, giving them the rating and the fully vetting those properties as to whether they were historic or not. And I would, in this particular case, even though I did not have a chance to really review this property, I was brought in at the last minute on it uh, in 2017, 2018. I was not able to really study these houses thoroughly, but at least the front house, the one uh, facing on the corner, I felt there were some historic merits to it. The other one had had some alterations, the 1910 house, but the 1916 house appeared to be intact, and it was a representation of the type of housing that existed at that time in that neighborhood, and uh, felt that it should have been more thoroughly vetted. And I uh, thank you very much. Um, hope you sustain the appeal. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, well, let's have a representative from the uh, from the project uh, speak. Uh, Heng Hoon Ho. Is there a representative from the project? Okay, is there any public comment? Looks like we've got uh, David Bell. Mr. Bell, are you still here? Oh, yeah, hi. I'm uh, my name is David Bell. I'm, I'm actually here on another matter, but I saw this was up. Um, two things. One is I, I actually almost bought this property, so I remember it explicitly. I ended up buying a property about a half a block away. I then moved into the property for a while. I was the president of the East Hollywood Neighborhood Council, which is this neighborhood at the time. And I actually walked the neighborhood for Survey LA. I remember they said it wasn't on Survey LA. And the only reason I can tell you it wasn't on Survey LA is because we just didn't get there because this place definitely would have been uh, designated. I remember it's got a, this unique sort of quality. That, that very, it's a very intact craftsman property. And the only other thing I would like to say about this is this sort of loophole on Charles Fisher, I've seen this come up before, where he doesn't somehow have a degree and therefore he doesn't know anything about history. The issue is whether it's historic. Charles Fisher has been a historian for 35 years. If he doesn't have a degree, I don't really care. I don't have a degree either, but I can talk about Abraham Lincoln and still be talking about history. So they just, you know, disqualify him on a loophole. And it's, okay. It keeps
meet's coming up. Thank you. I have my one minute. I'm one. I'm what one was your name, ma'am? Yeah, I'm one of the appellants. Oh, go, go ahead. Um, hi. So um, we keep hearing this issue about Charles Fisher, and um, on on a separate issue on the uh, on item number nine, we um, already submitted a letter from Richard Barron um, that says that. Charlie Fisher is a historian in good standing. He works with the CHC all the time and has for 35 years. So, um, and also, what the planner here is citing is the Secretary of Interior standards, um, which really have no relevance here because this is about CEQA. Um, so, what it what seems like is going on is that the planning department doesn't like what Charlie Fisher has to say, and so they're attacking his credentials and trying to invalidate them, when in fact, Charlie Fisher has been working with the city for 35 years. So I think we, ought, we, um, we really ought to think about the planning department's motives when they um, attack his credentials. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any more public comment on this item? Let's uh, hear from the uh, CD13 rep, Greg Bullock. Bullock. Good afternoon, my name is Craig Bullock and I'm with Council Member Mitch O'Farrell's office. Um, this afternoon, I wanted to convey the Council Member's concurrence with the Area Planning Commission and for denial of the appeal and sustaining the Director of City Planning's uh, um, letter of determination. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, do we have any uh, comments, staff, to the comments that were made by the public? I think you're on now. Hi. This is Christina Lee from the Planning Department. Um, I just want to re reiterate um, what um, Staff Jason Hernandez um, stated about the Charles Fisher. Um, it is true that um, he didn't meet the um, Secretary of Interior Professional Standards. Um, our also Office of Historic Resources also um, requires this when they re do review um, their historic reports. Thank you. Okay. Members, any, uh, any comments, thoughts on this? Okay, we're going to uh, deny the appeal filed by Robert Silverstein and thereby sustain the Central Area Planning Commission's determination in approving the categorical exemption for the project located at 1269 to 1279 North Lyman Place and 4576 West Fountain Ave. And if there's no objection, that will be the, that will be the order. Okay, next item. Councilman, next item is item eight. This is an MND um, that is being appealed, a CEQA appeal filed by Doug Haynes from the La Mirada Avenue Neighborhood Association. It relates to a 75 multifamily residential unit project on a vacant lot in CD13. Okay, planning. Eight. Item eight. It's item eight. We did receive a, uh, um, this is Christina Lee from the Planning Department, we di did receive a letter of extension from the applicant requesting it to be continued to um, June 28th, 2019. Okay. Okay. If that's, if that's what the committee desires. Uh, can we still have some public comment on this item? If you like to have the public comment today, Do we have any? Yeah. However, it will still need to take public comment again when the item is heard if you're going to continue it. Okay. All right, then we will continue this matter till June the 28th with, uh, with no objections. <clears throat> next item. Uh, Councilman, the next item is item 9, also a CEQA appeal relative to the adequacy of the categorical exemption. Um, and the appellant uh, that filed it is the Concerned Citizens of Los Feliz. Uh, David Lawrence Bell is the representative. Oh, and actually there is, uh, there is a second appeal by Los Feliz Improvement Association and also filed by Jamie Hall as a representative. Okay, do we have a report from staff? 
Yes, uh, good afternoon. My name is Jason Hernandez with City Planning. Uh, two sequel appeals for case number ENV 2018-2765 CE were filed regarding the director's planning decision to determine that the project is category exempt from the environmental review pursuant to City of Los Angeles CEQA guidelines, Article 3, Section 1, Class 3, Category 2. The appeals mainly rely on the same arguments and information as presented in the appellant's previous letters to the city on first level appeal of case number DIR 2018-2764 SPP as stated in staff's response letter to the Plum Committee dated May 16, 2019. The city has already adequately provided detailed and full responses to each of the appeal points in the central APC um, appeal report dated November 27, 2018. Nonetheless, the following represents a summary of the response given by staff for the sequel appeal points. First appeal point, a categorical exemption is inappropriate because the project site is a historic resource. Uh, the appellants contend that the two craftsman single family dwellings are considered historic and the categorical exemption was granted without proper analysis. The appellants provided a letter from Charles J. Fisher dated June 4, 2015, claiming the existing homes are historic. However, the letter does not substantiate or demonstrate why and or how the subject building would be considered historic, nor does the letter provide substantial evidence that the property is a historic resources as defined per public resource code section 21084.1 and or CEQA guidelines 15064.5. In addition, the appellants declared that the Los Feliz Improvement Association History Committee completed a historic property survey of the community in the 1990s, which was expanded in 2011 that identified the subject property as a contributor. However, this survey has not been approved by the State Register or National Register of Historic Places or by the City of Los Angeles Office of Historic Resources. Moreover, the survey does not contain all the vital information and evaluation necessary for the historical resource assessment report as required by the Secretary of Interior Standards and Guidelines for Historic Preservation. Second appeal point, LAMC section 1157C2 requires that the proposed project perform environmental review and incorporate mitigation measures. The appellant contend that staff did not make the environmental finding necessary for a project permit compliance per LAMC section 1157C2, which states the project incorporates mitigation measures, monitoring measures, monitoring measures when necessary or alternatives identified in the environmental review which would mitigate the negative environmental effects of the project to the extent physically feasible. Staff reviewed the entire record and ensured that there is no evidence that the exceptions to a category exemption apply. Third appeal point. No analysis has been conducted regarding mitigation of potential carcinogenic contaminants from the adjacent dry cleaners to the project site or former gas station adjacent to the project site. A geological study of the area is required. The appellants contend that hazardous waste contaminants were found on the commercial property adjacent to the project site in 2013 and therefore requires a phase one environmental site assessment to be conducted. According to the Department of City Planning's environmental assessment form, item H, a phase one ESA is required if the project proposed on land that is or was developed with a dry cleaning, automobile repair, gasoline station, or industrial manufacturing use or other similar type of use that may have resulted in site contamination. The lot has been developed with two single family dwellings which were built in 1911 and 1920 respectively. Therefore, the site was not developed with any use that may have resulted in site contamination. Moreover, according to EnviroStore, the state of California's database of hazardous waste sites, neither the subject site nor any site in the vicinity is identified as a hazardous, hazardous waste site. Therefore, a phase one ESA was not required. In regards to a phase one ESA and a phase two ESA needed due to the former gas station located at 4510 Franklin Avenue, the Los Angeles Department of Building and Safety issued a demolition permit on August 3rd 2004 along with permits to remove underground tanks of the former gas station. Moreover, there are standards behind an environmental due diligence where a phase one ESA or phase two ESA are conducted prior to a commercial real estate transaction for a property. This, proper, this process would make it difficult for a commercial building to be developed if the site was found to be contaminated and unusable. Furthermore, as previously stated, the project site was not developed with any use that may have resulted in site contamination. Lastly, Geology soils reports are not required prior to planning approval as the property is located outside of the city of Los Angeles Hillside area 
and does not require any grading or construction of an engineered retaining structure to remove potential geological hazards. In conclusion, no new substantial evidence was presented that the city has erred in its actions relative to the category exemption. The project opponent has the burden of producing substantial evidence showing a reasonable possibility of adverse environmental impact sufficient to remove the project from the category exempt class. Therefore, the sequel appeal should be denied and the actions of the Central Area Planning Commission should be sustained. This concludes staff's presentation. Okay, thank you. Do we uh, have the uh, a representative from the appellant here? David Lawrence Bell. And you've got five minutes, Mr. Bell. Thank you. Um, so, you know, the, the, the purpose of CEQA is basically to, to provide some kind of transparency to how they're going to do things that impact the environment, right? What we have here is a categorical exemption. So essentially, no CEQA analysis has been done of the, of the property. Um, and, and what we had here is <clears throat> the, the, the potential environmental impacts that we're talking about is, first of all, I was at the Central Area Planning Commission hearing. The issue of the gas station that was built apparently in the 1930s, okay, didn't come up until the hearing. The planning department had never even heard about the gas station. The property that is directly next door to this property, <clears throat> excuse me, has been a dry cleaners for decades. At the Central Area Planning Commission hearing, they brought in at pictures that the guy had taken of giant barrels that had the big, you know, skull and crossbones toxic waste symbols on them that they were hauling out of the backyard of this place. Yet no analysis was done. No analysis was done of the gas station pumping lead gas in there for 40 some years, as well as the toxic waste from the decades of the dry cleaners that was directly next to it. And what did they say? What did the planning department say? The planning department said two things. First of all, well, we looked up this parcel on the internet, and it's not listed on a website of toxic waste dumps, so we're okay. The next thing that the planning department said is, hey, if you're doing some kind of toxic thing like a dry cleaners or a gas station where you're pumping lead gas, and it's happening on the parcel, i.e. on the address that you're looking at, well, then we automatically, city policy is that we automatically do an environmental review under those circumstances. But here, they, weren't, they didn't have a dry cleaners on the lot. It was just right next door. And when someone mentioned, like, well, God, isn't this, like, potentially, like, ground contamination? The representative, and I believe it was this man right here from the planning department, said, there's a wall. There's a wall there. But the problem is the wall sits on top of the ground. And so unless the wall goes down to the center of the earth or something, you've still got the potential ground contamination, which was not, by the way, not analyzed at all. And then they came in and they demolished the building. So the kids going to school, the, the, the you know, it's a hundred, couple of hundred year old buildings, just, you know, uh, the, the dust wafting up into the air, it didn't really matter because they just went in and demolished it. Um, so it's this sort of Kafka-esque approach that we keep getting over and over again. We go to the planning commission, planning commission hearings, or the Central Area Planning Commission, we bring up new evidence that no one has ever heard, and, and, they, and they just they say, oh, well, sorry, but we have a report from the planning department where we rubber stamp it, which is literally why we litigate all the time. I've been a president of a neighborhood council. I'm a representative of the Los Feliz Improvement Association. I have been doing this for decades, and there's only one way we ever get anybody to listen to us. We file a lawsuit. It's the only way to do it, because then they have to listen to us. They have to file an answer. We have to have a settlement meeting, and eventually we go to court, and we just don't think that's the way to do it. We'd appreciate it if someone somewhere from the city would say, hey, you know what, if my kids live, live next door to this place, I sure would want them to test the soil to find out if there's toxic chemicals, to find out if there's lead in the soil before they tore the place down. That's all we're asking the city to do. That's not even to, not even to 
to, to discuss the issues about the historic resource, we had a hearing in front of the, uh, the Cultural Heritage Commission. Two of the three, two of the five members of the Cultural Heritage Commission believed that this property, which was owned by a guy named uh, Spencer Ackerman, who invented the term sci-fi, he lived there, he had a little museum, it was the Acker Mini Mansion, that we wanted to have for our kids to be able to see for, a, for you know, years to come. Two of the guys, two of the people on that committee believed that it should be a cultural monument, all right? But that, that wasn't even analyzed. In other words, it's like, yeah, yeah, some people think it should be a cultural monument, including historians and members of the Cultural Heritage Commission, but we don't really have to analyze it because someone from the planning committee or the planning department said, oh, Charlie Fisher doesn't have a degree, so it doesn't really matter. It doesn't make any sense the way we're being, uh, you know, treated by the city here. You know, the, the, the property is, I have 10 seconds left, the property is literally on a fault line that runs down Franklin. The house that's adjacent to the property fell off its foundation. How do we know whether the tanks that were under the gas station have been removed? How do we know whether if another earthquake comes, they're not going to rupture what's down there already? We need to have an analysis done of it. Thank you. All right, thank you. Another appellant, uh, Jamie Hall. You've got five minutes, sir. Good afternoon, my name is Jamie Hall. I'm a land use and environmental attorney with Channel Law Group, and I'm here today representing the Los Feliz Improvement Association, the other appellant. Um, our uh, CEQA appeal was filed in February, and, and that was filed uh, pursuant to Public Resources Code Section 21151C, which basically says that we have the right to appeal any CEQA determination to the, an elected decision-making body. Um, I'd like to focus on just one thing today. And that's the fact that the city issued demolition permits during the pendency of this CEQA appeal and the structures were demolished before there was a final environmental determination. This is a flagrant and blatant violation of the California Environmental Quality Act. It is fundamental that once an agency determines that an activity is subject to CEQA, that it must not take any action that changes the physical environment, including the issuance of demolition permits, until a final environmental determination has been rendered. The city had not rendered a final environmental determination at the time the demolition permits were issued. In fact, it's not even final today. That's what we are here to consider. Environmental reviews such as EIRs have been called the heart of CEQA, an environmental alarm bell designed to alert the public and their governmental representatives of environmental changes before they have reached ecological points of no return. An EIR is not a mere set of technical hurdles for agencies to overcome, but rather functions to ensure that government officials who decide to build or approve a project do so with a full understanding of the environmental quality consequences, and equally important, that the public is assured that those consequences have been taken into account. The law is clear. You cannot defer environmental review until after a decision is made on a project. CEQA guidelines section 15004A, entitled Time for Preparation, I'm going to read this, says, before granting any approval of, an, a, project, of a project subject to CEQA, every lead agency shall consider a final EIR or negative declaration or another document, such as an environment as categorical exemption, to be used in the place of an EIR. Um, this was long ago established by the California Supreme Court when it stated, if post-approval environmental review were allowed, EIRs would likely become nothing more than post hoc rationalizations to support actions that have already been taken. How is it? We filed a CEQA appeal and the city issued demolition permits and their structures are gone. Regardless of whether or not you agree with the ultimate outcome that this project is exempt from CEQA, the city has violated the law in doing this. And this is just the tip of the iceberg and it highlights a key problem that you have. The city has previously acted to prevent construction activity during the pendency of a CEQA appeal. For example, I'll give you just one example. On May 2nd, 2018, the city issued a notice of intent to revoke and a stop work order for a single family home at 3314 North Logano Place. The applicant had started grading while a CEQA appeal was pending. The city indicated in the stop work order that the building permits for the project were issued, quote, 
prematurely because the CEQA appeal was still pending. The assigned staff person told the applicant that, quote, until such action is taken by the city council, there should be no construction activity until the entire process has been completed. So how is it that it happened here? The city cannot have it both ways. Either the filing of a CEQA appeal prevents an applicant from proceeding with a project during the pendency of an appeal, or it doesn't. The city cannot treat similarly situated parties differently. The Federal Equal Protection Clause and its California counterpart provide that persons who are similarly situated must be treated alike under the law. Not only has a city violated the CEQA by authorizing the demolition of the structures prior to a final environmental determination, but they've also violated the equal protection rights of my client. We are currently in litigation over this project and we will be amending our petition to add both of these actions and we'll seek a declaratory ruling that the city violated CEQA by issuing the demolition permits. Thank you. Okay, let's uh, next hear from the project representative, uh, Mihran Keolian. Good afternoon, council members. My name is actually Daniel Friedman, and I'm okay. here. <laughs> that was close. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm the uh, representative. Uh, there it might have been a comment card mix up in there. Well, you're welcome. Thank you. Have, uh, Thank you have five minutes, please. Thank you, Councilman Price. Uh, Daniel Friedman um, with the law offices of Jeffrey Mangles, Butler and Mitchell. Um, I'm here, uh, I have the honor to represent um, the Afifis who are the owners of the property, hardworking immigrants to this country who started a small business, have grown it, have a beautiful family, who were able to afford to purchase this property which was a duplex um, and are able to thankfully add new housing to our city. So they're turning an old dilapidated duplex into a fourplex. It's something we all want, it's near a commercial corridor, it's a good thing for our city. Notwithstanding this, um, over many years now, um, there are people who apparently have a problem with the Afifis or, or have some problem with um, uh, the addition of housing or whatever it may be or have a problem with the city. I don't know. Um, their conduct, the appellants and this group, their conduct has been so over the top and, and you know, this comes from a representative who's done a lot of work in the city that it's been shocking to me. Um, on this case, what you have before you is a CEQA appeal. That's what this case is limited to, whether or not a categorical exemption was properly issued. I'm here to tell you and advise you that your planning staff did an excellent job on this matter. Um, it was controversial. Uh, it went through the process. It, they thoroughly vetted it. They properly issued the categorical exemption. It went to the Area Planning Commission and it was unanimous, and the appeal that was brought was unanimously denied. Um, I ask that you uphold the Area Planning Commission's denial. Um, I also want to address some of the issues that were raised. First off, uh, you've been <coughs> fed a lot of misinformation. First off, the claim that no analysis was done um, couldn't be further from the truth. Um, lots of analysis was done. In fact, I think um, you probably won't find a, a building in the city that wasn't more thoroughly vetted for historic, any, any type of historic status than this one. An analysis was done in 2010. Two, two analysis were done in 2015. It wasn't included in Survey LA. Um, in January of 2016, a full historic analysis was done. In February of 2016, the Office of, His uh, of Historic Resources here found it wasn't a historic resource. In March, in September, in November, studies have been done year after year. And the fact that we're even here today talking about it is shocking to me. Now, in a way, we're not talking about it, right? Because it really wasn't addressed in the appeal. Why was it not addressed in the appeal? Because it was demolished. But the fact is they didn't really care whether it was a historic resource or not. They're here to just cause problems. And I say that because now a new issue has come up, an issue that really wasn't even discussed previously, which is their claims that there's a toxic waste site on the property. The appellants have gone through the neighborhood posting notices that there's some type of toxic contamination being created by this project. Complete misinformation, no facts to support this claim. They're also claiming now that um, there's a fault line and that somehow this creates some type of issue 
for this fourplex, just to put this back into perspective. Again, no evidence that there's something unique about this property that this fault line would create some type of problem with respect to the categorical exemption. Finally, I want to address this last minute claim that has made and Mr. Hall addressed about this equal protection claim um, and about the city's process. And I just want to address the following. First off, they've already filed a lawsuit on this case. They barely even address the historic issue. So the fact that they even raise it again, I just don't think it's a genuine claim. Um, but they claim, uh, oh, equal protection, why didn't you stay the permits? Well, first off, that demo permit was applied for in 2014 or 15. This demo permit is on file for a long time. That's how long we've been fighting over this project. And so now, in 2019, they're shocked a demo permit was applied for? No, that's not correct. This site was, was proposed to be demolished almost a half a decade ago. Finally, if they really cared about the property, and I know Mr. Hall knows this, they could have gone to the court and asked for relief. They knew this was available to them, but they didn't pursue it. Why? Because honestly, I don't think they cared. But secondly, but now they get to make a big point of it and a big fuss of it here today in front of you. I ask that you deny this appeal. The evidence in, in front of you is clear, um, and we hope you support staff's recommendation to deny, this category, uh, deny, the, deny the appeal of the categorical exemption. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. We've got some public comment from Jamie Hall, Eric Zogarbian, uh, Jackie, Amy Gusenick, Angela Robinson, Karen Stetler, Kyle Harabi, Julia Russell, and Alex Kondraki. State your name, please. Hi, my name is Amy Gustinsik. I'm a uh, resident of Los Feliz, a neighbor of the property, and um, I, I have one main concern, and, and that's that we don't actually know if this is a toxic waste site, because while this property is adjacent to both a dry cleaner for many decades and a gas station that was built in the 30s and operated for over 70 years, there's been no testing on this property to determine if there is any toxic waste. And if the city can't take the most minimal effort to protect the residents of this city from that sort of development, then we have a real problem. So what I would like to see is some minimal testing of the property to see exactly what we're dealing with. Thank you. Next speaker, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Eric Zograbian. And I'm, uh, the Afifis actually are my in-laws. They're the parents of my wife. Um, the, unfortunately, they couldn't be here today, so I'm here on their behalf. I just want to point out that the Afifis have been living in this neighborhood for about 30 years. They've also had a small business in this neighborhood for 30 years. When this property became available and there was an old dilapidated two-unit <coughs> two on it, they purchased it in the hopes of developing it and improving the neighborhood. And that was going to be something that they were planning on leaving for their grandkids as well. Now, they followed all the rules, dotted all the I's, crossed all the T's, did everything the city asked them to do. And then now we come here and we have to face these appellants. And now being here for the first time, I realize that these people are professionals. This is what they apparently do for a living. And I don't know why they're trying to take it out on, on our family. And it's not nice. Especially, they're going around the neighborhood spreading lies and misinformation, including during public hearings such as this. I just respectfully request that you deny their appeal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, my name is Angela Robinson, and I live across the street from the proposed um, building. And um, we've been through this a lot, but I take personal offense to the characterization that I am a conspiracy, that I am professional at this. I live across the street. I have a 10-year-old son. I think you guys probably, some of you, have children too. So imagine your kid, and they're 10, okay? And there's a building across the street that's been standing there for 100 years. And in the middle of the night, it is demolished. That has not, I was looking at our 100-year-old um, craftsman, and we had to do all sorts of things just because of the lead paint. But the answers we've been given is that because it's not on exactly the parcel, 
then it for some reason doesn't count because there's a little wall there. And if there's only a 10 year um, history on what you guys will look at. So if it's beyond 10 years, then that's somehow out of the thing. So I would just like you to think about your own children and let's just get a, s a soil sample. Thank it's you. super easy. Thank you. Thank you. Karen Stetler and I'm a resident of Los Feliz as well, and I agree that there should be some environmental testing done. I have a letter here from a previous tenant of the property who witnessed, you know, barrels of and photographs of barrels that were labeled toxic waste that were pulled out of the property when they were renovating the dry cleaner, and I don't see any reason why it shouldn't be tested. And as far as improving the neighborhood with new housing, all this talk about affordable housing, as far as I know, the, the fourplex that's intended to be built there does not have any affordable housing attached to it. Thank you. My name is Joel Rocklin, and I'm an engineer, and I know how to use that machine, but somehow you didn't call my name. <laughs> okay, well, somehow you didn't show up either, so. Sorry? I said, go ahead. Okay. Um, I had a lot to say here, but I've actually changed it. I take... I, I am really astounded by what the attorney said. I'd like him to come up here and tell me what lies have been spread. I am not a professional here on that. I am an electrical engineer. I have enough knowledge to own fluid mechanics and fluids to know that with the gas station that was there that I used, it's very, very possible for that fluid to travel over and traverse over 30 feet, 20 feet, 10 feet. I'm a resident. I've lived there 68 years. and. I, like I said, you know, I'm going back to Sam Irwin of Watergate. I'm a simple country guy. Why not make the test? And as far as planning, I was this morning at an elementary, uh, middle school. I was grading their science projects, and one of the things was, what data do you use to substantiate your conclusion? And the planning committee did not have the data when they ruled about the gas stations and the toxic. They didn't do a scientific work, and Thank I you. am a scientist. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks for your comments. Good afternoon. I'm Julia Russell, and uh, thank you very much, council members, for hearing our considerations this afternoon. I uh, have lived on Russell Avenue since 1970. Uh, when I moved there, there was a gas station on the corner of Franklin and um, Hillhurst. And here's a picture of it. And that's just north of the property 4511 Russell Avenue, which is in question here today. Uh, so I'm just here quickly not to reiterate what Mr. Bell spoke so eloquently on, but just to uh, say that uh, I, as a resident, do have some concerns about possible soil contamination from the leaking, possibly leak, leaking, underground gas tanks. Finish your thought, please. I, my um, time, time is up already? Yes. Really? It is. You may end it with a, <laughs> You have a sentence you would like to end it with? Can I just say one last thing? Please. Which is, so basically it seems urgent to me that a full soil contamination test be done on the property along with a full environmental review. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Hi. Uh, my name is Alex Kondracki. Um, uh, Mr. Friedman just stated that we're all professionals. I mean, that's obviously a joke right? We're obviously not professionals. I happen to live across the street. Um, but that's not the only false information that Mr. Friedman has been spreading. Um, at the November 27th Central Area Planning Commission hearing, um, and I'm going to quote Mr. Mr. Friedman, um, he's talking about the gas station. He said, it was not adjacent to the lot, it was one lot over. And then he said, the gas station wasn't next door, it was one lot over, nor has it existed in our lifetime. Then he said the gas station was two lots over. All of those are false, okay? Um, uh, there was the gas station as evidenced in this photo right here, and I've submitted this um, to the council. If you look right behind this red car, you can see that there are tanks, and that is directly 
behind the property, right? So on one side, there's a gas station with tanks dating back to the 1930s, and on the other side, there is a dry cleaners. Um, and also, Mr. Friedman's like to mis mischaracterize what has happened in our neighborhood with regards to the Afifis. First of all, the Afifis don't live in the neighborhood. They live in the hills. They look down on their neighborhood. They took what was a lovely craftsman house. They terrorized the tenant, who was a single mom, into leaving. She was terrified. She was a friend of mine. All right, thank you very much. Uh, so he's mischaracterized everything about this. All right, thank you for your comments. Hi, Kyle Rabbi. Uh, I just want to bring up that the neighborhood citizens, they, their argument was twofold. It was both about taking down this historic house that could have contributed to an h pause and then also how the proposed building that's going to be there doesn't adhere to SNAP standards and design, gui design guidelines that talk about promoting development that enhances the quality of the environment and the living conditions of the residents. The fact that nine appeals were processed by neighbors says that they don't think that this is going to enhance their quality of life or their environment. But also, uh, in regards to Mr. Friedman's uh, say, speech that we could have applied for relief, that requires a $1 million bond. None of us are going to be able to put up a $1 million bond, so the only options that we have are to litigate or to appeal. And we're not here because we want to be and to cause trouble, we're here because we have to be. Our due process was a fiction, that's why we have to be here. So, that's all, thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Miran Kilian, and I was the, uh, the actual representative you, uh, um, on the actual appeal letter. I uh, just wanted to clarify a couple of things. The building is not going underground, just to make that clear. And also the gas station that was behind this building was now replaced by Bank of America. Bank of America tore the building down 20 years ago. They uh, filed for permits. They got permits approved. They uh, did environmental research as required. They took out the gas tanks. They cleaned up all the issues with the gas station, presumably, and they were approved by the city to build a, a Bank of America branch and a, new, and a brand new parking lot. So asking um, the Afifis to do all that over again is kind of ridiculous and redundant. I would just well, I just wanted to clear that up. All right, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Uh, I think you spoke, sir. I, I was. It was suggested, uh, this is Daniel Friedman, uh, JMM, yeah. it was suggested that I made mis misrepresentations in the record. Would you like me to address those or no? No, I'm sorry, sir. You don't have an opportunity to respond at this okay. time. Yes. Thank you for your comments. Thank you for all the uh, testimony that we've heard tonight, uh, this afternoon. Um, do we have a rep from CD4 in the house? Any comments from uh, CD4? Okay, planning staff, any comments? I'd like to respond to any of the concerns or issues raised? I just uh, want to reiterate that about the gas station. Um, LADBS issued demolition permits August 3rd, 2004 under permits number 04019-100124 and 04019-100125 with permits to remove underground tanks of the former gas station under permit number 04030-100576. Um, and as um, just previously stated, around 2007, uh, they received new permits in order for them to construct the commercial building that's currently existing on site, um, which is the Bank of America. Okay, thank you. Members, any comments? On, on that point, Mr. Smith. Yes, uh, planning, on that, on that point, did the B of A do soil testing as normally required by federal law on a gas yes. station? So, yeah, as part of their um, commercial real estate transaction, they are required to do their due diligence with the environmental, and whether that requires a phase one and a phase two, they would have to do that in order for them to do their I wish that would have been stated earlier, because I, I was really intrigued by a lot of the, the neighbors' comments about mm -hmm. this possible contamination right up until the very end when someone mentioned the B of A went there, and I said, well, that doesn't happen just by accident. They have to do the testing, so that clarifies that point. You really don't have an argument that there is contamination there if the test has been done for another property where the gas station actually existed. So if it didn't exist on that property, it's not going to exist on the property next door. It's just not going to happen that way. So I'm satisfied now. Thank you. Members? Okay, we're going to uh, deny the appeals and sustain the Planning Commission's determination in approving a categorical exemption for the project located at 4511 Russell Avenue. Thank you, that will be the order.
Next item. Uh, that concludes Mr. the CLA. agenda. Council. Pardon? That concludes the agenda, Council. Okay. With that, this meeting is adjourned.